Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming all this way. <coughs> I must say I'm extremely happy to be back in Budapest, where uh, for many, many years we did uh, the Polyphonics International Festival here in Szeged, and uh, it's a, a real pleasure to come back with this jungle. I insist on calling all this a jungle, not an exhibition, because as you see, there are no artworks on the wall. All the artworks are in your head. And um, I wanted to tell you that you should all have this poster, because it's very well done, and there's some very interesting documents made by our friend Christina, and then you can have them in the entrance there. And there's some very good, good information. And so the, um, the um, reason for this talk, you can come in, come in more if you like. The reason for this talk is to help you with some basic information concerning why we, I did this show, why this is the fifth station. It started in the Centre Pompidou Metz in France. It's a city on the German frontier, it's like the Centre Pompidou in Paris, but also in Metz. It went to Turquoise at the Frémois, and uh, it went to the Champs Libres in Rennes, that's in uh, Brittany, and it went to the ZKM in Karlsruhe, uh, <coughs> Germany. And this is number five station. And uh, it's, it's a very complex show, very complex collage, moving collage. So I think it would be very helpful for me to give you some basic stuff on this. Uh, it took me 23 years to put all this together. 23 years of work, starting with the big interview of Alan Ginsberg over there that we did in his hotel room and in my house in Paris in 1990. That was 23 years ago. And it was a six-hour interview. And he said things in there that he had never seen said before. Because you know with journalists, it's a big problem. They ask you stupid questions, and you have to make intelligent answers in one, with one second, you know? It's impossible. So he's very frustrated with that. So he was very happy, since we were all friends, to do this long interview, where he says for the first time, he's also the, the founder of the uh, main generation, and it's, it's historian. He, 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 he is the historian of all the tribe, of all the events. And around that interview, that you, you will see at the back, where you have very good titles, subtitles, in Hungarian, that were done by some friends here very well. Um, I constructed this jungle around here. It's a jungle because it's not the usual kind of passive show that you see in museums where you are told what to see. Here, you can walk around. You walk around everywhere. You do what you want. You come from one place to another, you bounce, you take a vision from here, you can see five or six screens at the same time, and they're all moving. And then you change, and you go somewhere else, and you see four other ones. So, in your mind, you construct yourself the jungle of images and sounds. Now there's no sound because uh, of this little talk, but as soon as I finish the sounds, all the sounds will come up again. And in any way, you have very good uh, subtitles. So, my idea was to uh, give the young public today, which uh, very often do not read books anymore because of internet, you know, uh, and uh, this extraordinary uh, tribe of great visionary poets, they need to be read, they need to be heard. And they need your, your intellectual and, and emotional participation in that work. Poetry, just like music, it needs
needs a listener, it needs a mind. And it is transmitted from one mind to another mind. And here you have things that have never been seen before. 50% of the elements in this jungle were never put together before. So I will suggest that we walk around together. I will give you some information on what you see on the streets. And we walk around. And at the end, uh, if you're not too tired, we can, uh, you can ask questions and I'll do my best to answer. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> so, let's start with what we have right in front of our eyes. This is a blues that Adam Ginsberg wrote when his father died. He was very close to his father, who was also a poet, but a very classical poet, and a teacher in the Liceum. And uh, he wrote Father Death Blues on the airplane when he heard that his father died. He was coming back to New York for the funeral and he wrote that blues. And Allen Ginsberg, of course, was very influenced by black uh, jazz, black music, black blues. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he sang and played in his performances because Allen and William Burroughs and all the, all the great big, big poets were performers. Uh, they believe that poetry should be something that is physical, that is physically transmitted from one person to another. And so they did it on stage with music, sometimes with jazz, sometimes with rock music. And uh, there's no frontier between music and poetry and philosophy and painting. No, it's the same emotions that are coming out. Here we have a very interesting movie that was shot partly in New York, partly in Paris, and partly in Israel. And it's a very interesting uh, document. It was shot by Namjoon Pike, the great, great master of video art. And uh, that's Ginsburg's father, Louis Ginsburg. And um, uh, you will see also um, Ginsburg here um, in, in many different situations. And he did a poetry reading, many poetry readings with his father, which is a very moving and interesting thing for a, a young poet to do. And here, right in front of us, we have a great genius of free jazz. That's Arnett Coleman. He invented free jazz in the 60s. And there you have Arnett Coleman and Gregory Corso and an Indian drummer. That would, this is shot in the studio of uh, uh, Ornette Coleman in New York. That's Gregory Corso. And you will see some of these poets in at different times of their lives. When they're very young, they're middle-aged and very old. And this is Gregory Corso, very, very old. Uh, and he's reading poetry with Ornette Coleman. I don't know if you realize that this extraordinary document this is. And, um, Ornett Coleman was, uh, is still alive, and a great, great musician, and they improvise together, like poets do. Here, in the other, other video, is in my house in Paris, Anna Ginsberg is improvising a poem, especially for the camera, for us, on a little notebook. And he's saying, returning to Paris, <coughs> 1957, 1957 is the date where we met in Paris. And then we met at the Beach Hotel. This is the hotel. And this is Adam Ginsberg uh, taking a photo of the Beach Hotel. And why is it called the Beach Hotel? Because it was the cheapest hotel in Paris. It was very dirty. And there were rats all over the place. And there was only one telephone and one toilet. But they loved it. And it was populated by jazz musicians, uh, 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 deserters from the from the war, Vietnam War, uh, people from all over the world, music, uh, poets and everything. And that's, we visiting, Alan and I, we visited it again in 1990, just before it was re renovated and destroyed. <coughs> and Alan is showing us the rooms where he lived, where William Burroughs lived, where Brian Dyson lived. This is the Room of Corso, Gregory Corso. And um, very important because it's in that hotel that he 
he started writing his second masterpiece. The first masterpiece by Allen Ginsberg is called Howl. It's a great manifesto that he wrote and performed for the first time in 1956 in San Francisco. And the second one is called Kaddish. It's about the death of his mother. His mother, Naomi, was a schizophrenic. She spent the second part of her life in insane hospitals. She was very, very sick, very mentally sick. And she thought the FBI and the KGB were put, uh, putting electric things in her brain to control her thoughts. The poor thing, she was suffering very, very much. And uh, he, was, uh, um, he wrote this poem about his mother, and he wrote it in Paris. He started to write in Paris, and then he continued in New York. And there he is telling uh, things about how William Burroughs uh, started writing Naked Lunch, the famous book by William Burroughs. <clears throat> he started to write it in Tangiers, and he finished it also in the Beat Hotel in Paris. <coughs> Paul, do you have a, a, a bit of water? Because my, uh, my uh, thank you very much. Excuse me for a second. You know, I'm sorry. I need to take a drink. Thank you. Thank you. And um, this is the photo that's outside. It's a very important photo. It's Allen Ginsberg sitting on his bed in the Bean Hotel, and behind him, you see the same photo in the, in the uh, entrance of the show, is Arthur Rimbaud. And you, that explains why they came to Paris and stayed for two, three, four, five years. Because they identified with Rimbaud. They identified with Dostoevsky and with William Blake. And they had to leave America. You know, Allen Ginsberg wrote a very important book called The Fall of America in the 70s and 80s because he already visioned what is happening to America today, how it is destroying itself with the drones in Afghanistan and the horrors of the Iraq war and Guantanamo and the racism and the horrors that's going on in America that is self-destructive. Society is self-destructing, and um, that's why they left America. They went to Tangiers and went to Paris because they identified with a, a sort of mythical Paris, not the Paris of, the, of reality of, of the society today, but of the mythical Paris in which people like James Joyce and Henry Miller and Jean Genet and Samuel Beckett lived and these uh, English-speaking writers had been published in Paris first, before they were published in America or England. And so it was a mythical place where poets could be free to write what they wanted, whereas in America there was a lot of censorship. That's the reason why they came to Paris. That's what he's explaining here. And um, then we continue walking, if you will. And uh, uh, while you're walking, make sure you look behind you and you see through the transparency of the, of the uh, screens, you see this collage that is uh, beginning to take shape in your own heart, in your own mind. And all these images can come together like in a dream, you know? And you dream, dream this extraordinary adventure which was the new generation. So here we have the the heart of the show, which is the four-hour uh, <coughs> interview that he did with me in 1990 in Paris. And uh, uh, very soon, we hope, we were talking about this with Peter Weibel yesterday, last night, and uh, we were hoping to put out a DVD of this, uh, of the complete four-hour interview, because he really is acting like a very precise historian. He's taking every one of the great poems that they wrote, he and the others, and he's explaining the context and why they did it, where they did it, when they did it. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's extraordinary stuff. Because it's not the stuff that teachers in schools or university, they don't know anything about that. And it's wonderful to hear it from the poet himself, you see. And that's what this is. And um, over here, if you want to continue, this is another interview I did uh, with William Burroughs and Brian Geisen. And uh, they were very good friends of mine, also at the Beat Hotel. And uh, they are explaining how they invented the cut-ups. If you have read the great books of William Burroughs, you know what a cut-up is. 
there's a, um, he would have a, imagine a table, yeah? and uh, you put on the table um, <clears throat> several layers of newspaper, huh? and then you take a, a newspaper or whatever you want, and you take a razor blade and you cut squares or rectangles in it. And uh, that's what Brian Geisen did, because Brian Geisen is the one who invented the cutoff. He did it to protect uh, some drawings that he made on the table. And all of a sudden, he realized that if you take several pages off, uh, they, they have chance operations, that words come together that were not planned by the writer. All of a sudden, you invent new kind with new grammar, new, new lexicology. And it's called the cutout, because they jumped from one thing to another, and you invented something there, uh, a bit like sound poetry, if you will, like the data poetry of Hugo Ball. And um, so there he's explaining that. And uh, William Burroughs was always saying that uh, uh, the writing was 50 years behind the technique of uh, plastic arts. And so that's his point of view. And uh, he's explaining how they invented that by mistake. You see? So the wonderful thing about this kind of poetry is a bit like Jackson Pollock with his dripping. You know, the dripping always existed in, in art history. Every painter that was using liquid paints or, or water or, or oil was always dripping. But what they did before Pollock was they took away the dripping. They, they washed it away. Whereas Pollock in left so he was using his own mistakes, and, uh, as, and, and frankly, they were not mistakes, they were a new way of painting. And so that's what the cut-ups were also. And so a new way of writing and using the uh, chance operations, a bit like the écriture automatique, the uh, automatic writing of the surrealist, if you will. So uh, Brian Dyson, who's in the middle, and uh, William Burroughs on the right, is uh, telling you about that story, telling you that story. And uh, if you go back, you turn around, and you see another thing in front over there, what do you see in that screen or in front of you? These are collages by William Burroughs. You see? You have William Burroughs here, and you have William Burroughs there, and you see, you see those, those black forms? Those are silhouettes to, to shoot bullets. You see, that's the signature of William Burroughs. On, on the target, his targets on paper, and those are his his collection of of, of uh, uh, magazines on guns. And uh, he he loved guns, and uh, he, he he shot at these paper targets. And I, as as I just pointed out, he signed the targets like an artwork. You see, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that was uh, uh, done in the, the place called the Bowery in New York. This is a very interesting thing. That uh, in, in, in this, where this is, it's on the Bowery. The address is 222 Bowery. And uh, in those days, the Bowery was a very rough place to live. And the, uh, where is it? It's right near Chinatown. And interesting thing is that during the Second World War, the French painter, Fernand Léger, uh, ran away from Hitler and spent the war in New York. And he was living right there. And in that studio, many, many years later, John Giorno, who you will see also here in this exhibition, uh, uh, is now living in the same place that uh, uh, <coughs> Fernand Léger used as a, as, um, as a in studio. And underneath, there's a place called the Bunker. The bunker is like, a, a, you know, a bomb bunker or a submarine. There are no, no windows. It's a really closed place. And there are big tubes on the wall for, uh, for heating. And William Burroughs was very happy there. He was hiding away in there. And he, he said, I'm going to the bunker. You know, he sounds like that. And uh, he wrote many important things in that address to, to, to Bowery. And that film there was shot in that place that I'm talking about. <coughs> Let's continue our little, a little trip around. Um, uh, on the other screen over there, you see other artworks of William Burroughs that we, he, he shot with a shotgun. Uh, he would <coughs> put 
put a piece of uh, wood on the floor or on the wall, he would put paint uh, box, uh, boxes and he would shoot at it with his, with his gun and it would make splashes and he would make uh, that kind of uh, uh, action art if you want. And over here, on, we continue, see, on, on the, that black and white thing over there, was, this is very important. It was Chicago, 1968. <coughs> and there was a demonstration, thank you very much. There was a demonstration against the, uh, the, the politics of America. The so-called Democratic and Republican parties they have these big shit uh, uh, things for elections every four years. And um, that's William Boros. He's uh, addressing the young people who are demonstrating against the Vietnam War. And now in a few minutes you will see next to him, thank you, and then next to him you will see Jean Genet, the great French writer who came to be with them in Chicago in 68. Um, you were probably all born after 68. That's Jean Genet on the screen, uh, you see? And Jean Genet and uh, Allen Ginsberg and uh, William Burroughs, as you see on the poster, uh, demonstrated together uh, uh, against the Vietnam War and um, uh, Jean Genet was beaten on the head and he was bleeding, beaten by the police, of course. There was 400,000 people demonstrating and they were there. And William Burroughs said something very important uh, concerning uh, intellectuals and artists and writers and politics. And I'll try and say it with his voice. Well, now we have to put our ass where our mouth is. <laughs> so you have many readings of that. It's not only uh, erotic meaning, it's also a political meaning. It means that when you talk, you have to put your ass, your body, where your talk is. And if you're talking about freedom, you have to really fight for it. That's what he's also saying. So as a poet, he had many meanings, and this is one, at least two, maybe there are three or four other ones that we won't talk about today, but we can talk about some other time. And so that's Jean Genet trying to speak in English. And these are the, the people, the demonstrators in Chicago, and uh, it uh, shows one thing that's very important, that the Beat Generation people, not only the poets, but the people, were all very international. You know that Alan Ginsberg came here to Budapest several times. He loved this city. He made performances with poetry, of poetry and jazz here in your city many times. And uh, there he is on stage. There he is on stage, also in Chicago in 68. And right behind him with the white sweater is a wonderful beatnik, a wonderful uh, writer. Uh, <clears throat> oh, Christ, I, I, all of a sudden I have a blank in my mind. Uh, um, I'll give you his name in one second. Um, and uh, uh, they were all doing this, uh, this uh, um, poetic event action. In, in the middle of the demonstration, because the, <clears throat> the demonstration was going to be very violent. You know, the police were beating everybody up, and they were saying, we have to be courageous. You know, he, uh, Allen Ginsberg was physically very, very courageous. He was a Buddhist. He was a non-violent guy. You see the police there with their guns in Chicago? He was a very, very uh, non-violent man, but very uh, extraordinarily uh, courageous in situations like that, trying to keep people calm and to not to avoid provocations. And this very, very strong thing to do. And let's continue and just change around and look at the screen over there in the next room. <coughs> I would like you to please uh, uh, maybe come back uh, uh, two or three times because there's so much stuff to see in this exhibition, in this jungle, that you will have a difficulty to see everything in one time. So, here we have something that is extraordinary again. It's a film that I shot in 1990. I had organized <clears throat> an exhibition of Allen Ginsberg photographs in Paris, in a place called <coughs> La Fnac. 
And as you see his photographs, oh, thank you very much. He, as you see his photographs, he wrote the story underneath them. So you have the, the great photos. By the way, he was a pupil of Robert Frank. He, Robert Frank gave him his first Leica and told, taught, taught him how to use it. So he makes these photos and he writes the story that's happening in the photo underneath it. And in this film, he is explaining when he did it, who is the person in the photo, <coughs> what was going on in the life of everybody at that day, and the context, the general context of the photo. In other words, he is really doing the work of the historian. Not only is he the visionary poet, a great photographer, he is also the historian of the whole business. And that's what this film is about. He's explaining the photos, he is going from one photo to another and, you know, telling the whole story. And here, uh, on these uh, uh, sets, you can sit down and you choose whatever sequence you want to. You put the earphones on your ears and you can relax and, and study whatever you want to study again and see again. And um, <clears throat> in the next room, for, for the time being, there's nothing. But we're hoping to, <coughs> very soon, next week, Christina is going to <coughs> try and get the, the great masterpiece of the um, um, Beat Generation. It's a film that was shot in 1959. It's called Pull My Daisy. It was shot by Robert Frank, the great photographer, and Al Leslie, an artist friend. And the actors are... <laughs> Uh, Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, Jack Kerouac, and the voice that you hear improvising the poetry is the voice of Jack Kerouac. And that was shot in 1959. It's the only movie of their story in which they play. And that's very important because I suppose you read the papers, like I do, and you notice that this horrible Hollywood He's making a lot of movies about the beatniks now, you know? They made about Kerouac, about Ginsburg. One, <coughs> one is coming out uh, this week, and with horrible Hollywood actors. The guy who played Harry Potter, you know? He's playing now Harry, and, uh, he's not playing Alan Ginsburg. It's so ridiculous, you have to laugh. And, and so, you know, they, they hate the poets. They make the life miserable for the poets and the artists, and they, they, and, but when they're dead, all of a sudden they love them, you know? But first they have to die to be loved, you know? That's the whole story, you know, from Van Gogh onwards, or even before Van Gogh. So I think this show, this jungle is important because instead of all that Hollywood ideology bullshit, you have the voice of the poets themselves. You go directly and you can hear their voice, you can hear why what they're doing and why they're doing it directly and you don't need all the propaganda for hollywood or wall street or what let's go back if you want and um, see some more if you if it's okay with you and um, we continue a little bit let me get another glass of water you see alan is still continuing to explain everything about each photo it's a really incredible document Yeah. And so, uh, as I said before, 50% of the stuff here in these rooms have never been seen nor put together before. This is really interesting. Why did the Americans not do this before? Why is this happening in Europe, you know, in five places in Europe? Three in France, one in Germany, and now here in Budapest. Why? This, these are great American poets. Why don't the Americans do this? It's a good question, you know? And uh, um, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, this is an interview of Allen Ginsberg in Paris in 1965 in a wonderful bookstore called Shakespeare and Company. And on his lap, maybe you noticed it, there's a book. It's the book that I made, <coughs> an anthology of big poetry that was published in Paris then. And he is trying to speak French. And that's really wonderful because he can't speak French. So he invents words. He invents words. And he's very expressive. You see? And he's, he's, 
he's in, he's for, that, next to him is Gregory Corso, uh, standing up. And there's a stupid journalist next to him. And the journalist, as always, is asking a stupid question. He says, oh, Mr. Ginsburg, uh, you always write with, when you're drunk or when you're taking drugs? And he says, well, you know, the worst uh, drug is this stupid journalism and, and, and TV, you know? So that's the worst drug, the most dangerous drug. And then the journalist asks Gregory Corso, this guy who's standing up, do you take drugs too? And he says, no, 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 I only drink wine. You know, like everybody else, which of course is the same thing. So that's him, that's him, that's Gregory Corso. It's the same man, the same lovely angel guy, that you see in the movie with uh, uh, Ornette Coleman, looking like 500 years old, you know, and in between, there's 50 years of heroin. So I'm not saying to, be, to do that, of course, don't ever do it, but they, they did it, <laughs> and they, uh, they're making fun of everything. And uh, <clears throat> over there, behind my back, uh, the, the, you have, um, in front of me here, you have uh, um, Michael McClure, a wonderful poet from San Francisco, uh, standing up with a white shirt. <clears throat> He is uh, reciting a wonderful poem that he wrote, a sound poem, in the, the Fest Polyphonic Session and the Song in the Blue. And uh, uh, he was one of the first uh, eight poets. You, you'll see him in another uh, shot here somewhere, where he is standing with uh, Ginsburg and Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan was a big fan of Ginsburg and Michael McClure. And Michael McClure wrote songs <coughs> for a lot of uh, uh, great rock and roll uh, uh, singers. And behind him, behind Michael McClure, in the other screen towards the wall, is a wonderful interview of Jack Kerouac done by Quebec Canadian television. Because the first language of Kerouac was French. He was a French Canadian and he learned English only very late in life and he wrote in English so that his mother, who was very Catholic, could not understand what he was writing. That, that's why he wrote in English. And right in front of me, pointing here, on the left is Phil Glass, the great musician, and Allen Ginsberg on the right, and they made an opera together that uh, <coughs> Bob Wilson produced. And uh, uh, Phil Glass was a very good friend of, of Ginsberg, and they are improvising there uh, in that situation. And so you see, you have all kinds of documents, all kinds of feelings, all kinds of moments. And behind the screen, black and white, at the end, are small parts of Pull My Daisy, this fantastic uh, film that was shot in 1959 in New York, 16 millimeter by Robert Frank, in which you see Corso, Ginsburg, and, and you hear Carol. So, uh, I think I've given you an idea about what all the elements are here, and I hope that you, you will have time and desire to come back. And uh, these are portraits of Ginsburg and Kerouac by uh, Robert Crumb, the fantastic uh, uh, comic book. Right in front of me here, this is Charlotte Moorman, <coughs> and doing with Hansen Peng, a thing called Robot Opera in 1965, also in my festival in Paris. And they were very close to Alan Ginsberg. And uh, Matthew Pike, the fellow who was moving there on the left, he's the one who did this great movie uh, with Alan Ginsberg. And he did many por video portraits of Alan Ginsberg. So here, if you are interested in poetry and the mind, the inner mind of the poets, you will have a lot of good information, and I hope uh, vitamins that will create in you the desire to be poets also. Uh, so that's what, that's the reason for all this. So the man whose name I forgot in, in 1968 was Ed Sanders. And this is an interview of Kerouac in, in, uh, in English uh, uh, concerning the Greek generation. Ed Sanders wrote some wonderful books of poetry, and uh, there you are. Uh, so welcome to the jungle, and uh, feel free to move around, to come back as long as you want, and 
and to meditate with the poets. And thanks for coming. If you This show is starting today, it's the first day, and how long will it last? Till uh, January. Till January. So you have plenty of time, and uh, this is your house now, so be welcome. <laughs> What do you think uh, what's the uh, main difficulties of translating Japanese words and poems? Difficult? Difficult, yeah. Mm -hmm. To learn. Ah, it's a big problem, not only for Allen Ginsberg's poetry, but for all poetry. He invents words, invents feelings, invents ways of thinking and writing that you don't have in other languages. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I translated with him in 1958-59, straight form Hall, he writes something that's very banal in the language of uh, the counterculture of that day, those days. He talks about turning on. Turning on means smoking marijuana or getting drunk. You know, but how do you translate that into French or Hungarian or German or Japanese? You see, because it, turning on is a, a metaphor used in electricity. Turn on the lights. What he was meaning there that if you smoke marijuana, that's it. I'm not making propaganda for marijuana. <clears throat> I'm just trying to answer your question. Uh, turning on the lights. And if you smoke some joints, you turn on the light in your brain. That's the metaphor, okay? So, how did I do that in French? I used the, the, uh, the uh, technical word for turning on electricity, branché, branché d'électricité. And so, uh, it, the, the poem was published and it had a big success. And that's a very strange thing that happens when as a human being, as an individual, as a normal citizen, you take a word and you put it in the common language that everybody uses. And then you don't recognize it anymore because they use it out of context. It means something completely different. And all of a sudden, stupid politicians were saying, oh, I'm conché, you know? You know what I mean? And taking it out of the poem tree completely and emptying it of meaning. So it's a very difficult problem. Uh, I have no particular solution. I uh, just say that uh, um, if a poet is inventing language, you have to in invent the corresponding metaphors in your language. That's the best I can do to answer your question. It's a very difficult job. That's why I think that what they did here with the subtitles is pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. There's somebody here. Um, I read the uh, book Naked Lunch and I saw the movie which was uh, directed by uh, David Cronenberg and I was just wondering, um, I did not understand one word of the book but the movie I did. Um, how close do you think the uh, movie adaptation got to the essence of the uh, prose uh, writing? Ah. Well, it's not my day today. That's another <laughs> rough question. Very rough question. Nick uh, Cronenberg, I don't know if you like his work. I think he's a great filmmaker. That's one point. The second point is that he's a great admirer of William Burroughs. There's no doubt about that. And even they know who knew each other because he, William Burroughs played a little role in that, in a, sitting in one of the restaurants. You know? The problem is, that the movie has nothing to do with Naked Lunch. <laughs> you know? 
because the producers, you know, the, we live in a capitalist society. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> uh, it's a very tough society to live in. Because the people who have the money are the ones who decide the meaning of things. So David Cronenberg cannot just shoot a movie. He has to have producers. And the producers put a lot of money in this film. And when he starts making things too close to what William Burroughs was doing, in other words, using pornography, using uh, direct criticism of the government, etc., etc., uh, talking about his own uh, um, experiences with homosexuality, very private things, etc., 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 the producer said, Are you crazy? We can't have that in the movie. Take that out, take that out, take that out. And finally, what's left is what the producers wanted. So, was the right first version? Uh, director's cut? No. I, David tried to do his best. He was an honest about it. But I think the only possibility, if you ask me my opinion, I could be wrong, of course. I think that the only possibility, after 50 or 60 years of fighting in this damn society, to try and change it, is to do something in the underground. The way Jonas Vegas did, the all the underground movie makers. The way, uh, if you look at the movie I was telling you about, um, Pull My Daisy, Robert Franklin, to not try to make a movie for Hollywood because they don't understand anything. They're idiots, not the filmmakers. The producers and the distributors, they don't want to hear poetry. They want money. That's the only thing that they're interested in. So if you want to make something concerning Charles or Ginsburg, make it. But do it with your own heart and mind, with your own means, even if it's very modest. And don't try and sell it to Hollywood, because it will never, they'll never accept it. They, remember, I was telling you before, that there was a, a shot here of Jean Genet uh, <coughs> with Ginsburg and Burroughs in Chicago in 68. Very important moment in history for all of us. Well, Jean Genet made an extraordinary masterpiece of movie. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's called La Chambre d'Amour. It's after one of his own poems. It's a, it's a very homosexual movie about two guys that are in jail, and I won't tell you the whole movie. It's an extraordinary masterpiece of, of, of visual art. There's no doubt about that. And why is it a masterpiece that is not uh, censored? Because Genet never signed the, 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 the papers to have it commercially distributed. He, he knew it would never appear in the commercial distribution. So he said, don't even ask me to sign anything. This exists and it has to be seen only in the underground distribution. Even today, Jeanette has been dead for many, many years. But if you want to see that movie, you have to go through some underground way of seeing it and you organize a, 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 a projection in your house or some place where there's no, no money involved. And that's what you wanted, to be free. And to be free, you have to be outside the capitalist system. That's what George Renee understood. I don't know if, if you agree with this, but that was his opinion. And uh, Brandenburg tried, and of course, Hollywood uh, was stronger than him. I don't know if you accept that explanation. That's a great explanation. It's one possibility. <laughs> <coughs> my, 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 my throat is getting very dry. Uh, why don't you talk now? <laughs> it's your turn, okay? And if you don't want to talk, we can put the sound up and uh, we can continue the from now. Anyway, thank you for all coming. Anyway, and I hope you you enjoy your your promenade in the forest. <laughs> 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 <laughs>